Hello, my friends, and welcome to Star Wars How Powerful Is, the series where we explore the strength and abilities of those in a galaxy far, far away. In today's installment, we will be examining the power level of the famed Jedi Knight turned Tusken war leader Sherad Het, the former apprentice of Eeth Koth and father of Asherad Het, the Jedi Master who would later go on to become Darth Krait the primary antagonist of the Star Wars Legacy comic series that ran from 2006 to 2013. While the narrative parallelism was obviously not intentional from the start, Sherad Het shared much in common with the Jedi Grandmaster Cole Skywalker, the previous character I examined on this series. Despite only physically appearing in four issues of the Outlander arc of the Star Wars Republic series, Sherad could legitimately be argued to be one of the most pivotal secondary characters of the entire Star Wars EU, with many of the prequel era centric characters possessing some form of relationship to him, and a number of story elements pertaining to future eras being connected to his actions in some way, shape, or form. As far as characterization goes, Sherad was very much a knight outside of his time, being a staunch adherent to the core principles of the Jedi Code, while also holding a powerful reverence for the concepts of love and connectedness much like the Jedi of the distant past and future. I would even go a step further and say that the Howl Runner was somewhat grey Jedi-like in how he is portrayed due to his blending of light side restraint with Tusken savagery. As always, we are going to be proceeding in a power scaling sense with this video and how Sherad Head stacks up exclusively within the confines of his own franchise. So apologies in advance to anyone who clicked on this expecting me to rank him against Kaze Kage Gara or any other famous fictional desert dweller. I'll tackle crossover scaling in future installments, but given Head's obscurity, I'm just going to keep things strictly Star Wars from here on out. With all that out of the way, let's get started. Okay, so before we dive into the core of Sherad Het's true strength, we first need to pinpoint his rank within the Old Jedi Order and how said rank contributes to his combative capabilities. While a Jedi's rank does not always equate to their level of power, they still provide a general outline for their levels of training and experience, as well as a definitive scale for their level of authority within the organization. Throughout the Outlander story, Sherad is said to have completed his Jedi training under Eeth Koth, with Kiadi Mundi directly referring to the Tusken as a Knight of the Jedi Order. Despite seeming like a fairly open and shut case for Het having been a Jedi Knight before his self-imposed exile, various guides and even the biography of his toy have directly referred to the Champion of Kermar as a Jedi Master. Broadly speaking, there are two ways I feel you can best rationalize this inconsistency. The first, and most obvious, is that it's just another one of those occasional EU labeling mistakes. After all, there are guides that do refer to Sherad as a Jedi Knight in accordance with the comic, and the accuracy of the toy bio is questionable since it also refers to Mundi as a Jedi Master, despite that not technically being true at the time. The second way you can look at it is through a more metatextual lens. As noted by the Jedi Path, the two primary methods by which a knight can be granted the rank of master is either by successfully completing the training of a Padawan learner, or by undergoing a more challenging variation of the Jedi Trials, successfully demonstrating a level of wisdom and power worthy of the classification. Sherad's parentage of Asherad gave him the opportunity to take on an apprentice, his rise to warlord status pushed him to develop a new ideology, and a Yark, basically a sister-in-law, claimed that he had emerged stronger after undergoing their clan's brutal initiation trials. Taking all of these factors into account, 
You can sort of justify Het's inconsistent rank designations with the idea that his experiences on Tatooine molded him into someone worthy of the Jedi Master title, even if it was never officially given to him. I know that sounds silly, but such concepts aren't unprecedented in the lore as Luke Skywalker was only considered to be a full Jedi Knight after his confrontation with Vader and the Emperor, which is a rather perfect visual shorthand for the Trial of Insight. The question then becomes, what do the Knight and unofficial Master titles signify concerning Sherad Het's combative abilities? And the answer is a lot. Jumping back to the Jedi path, it states that Masters are most notable for their ability to pass on their wisdom to future generations, with Council members of course being the general apex of the rank. While all Jedi instruction is valuable, Sherad receiving his training from a Council member was not exactly a bad way for him to start out, especially since Eith Koth was routinely dispatched to the farthest, most dangerous regions of space. Although instruction from a council member does not guarantee that the student will rise to a similar status, it tends to happen rather often, and due to the nature of Sherad's accolades, which we will cover more later, I think it makes the most sense to assume that his peers universally recognized him as wise, experienced, and strong enough to be worthy of a council seat, and therefore on the council level, even if a spot was never conferred to him. All that being said, these are all just titles. Are there any descriptions or feats that support the idea that the Tusken Jedi was this strong? The answer is, again, yes. There are several descriptions and feats in lore that directly support the idea that Sherad Het was not only on the Council tier, but decently high on the Council tier, even with his limited exposure. Next, we will analyze Sherad Het's Force abilities, which are sadly the least explored of his combative attributes, but by no means absent. Starting with just his raw power level, Kiadi Mundi's entry in the official Star Wars fact file refers to Sherad as a powerful Jedi, with the defender of Campara citing his growing might as one of the main reasons for his self-imposed exile. Now, taken on their own, these accolades are pretty vague, as there have been many Jedi who have been noted to possess power beyond the norm, yet there is still a substantial differential in their capabilities. For example, Jason Solo and Ganner Rydaso are both confirmed to be abnormally powerful Jedi, yet they are clearly not on the same level. Ganner even admits as much during the Vong War. Fortunately, Het's training and lineage logistics largely smooth out this issue. When news of Sherad's survival was brought to the Jedi Order, Eith states that his former student would be a powerful weapon in the hands of the re-emerged Sith if he had fallen to the dark side of the Force during his absence. Considering that Darth Maul's battle with Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi on Theed was seen as proof that the Sith were not only back, but deadlier than ever, it's not unreasonable to assume that Sherad's raw power would pose a threat to even the high-tier Force users of the prequel era. Which makes sense considering what Dooku, another legendary Jedi of his era, ultimately became. Having hailed from a planet that had spawned numerous Jedi, Sherad's innate connection to the Force was considerable, with the spirit of Qui-Gon stating that the Het bloodline held great strength during and after his time. That said, Sherad did admit point-blank in the fifth issue of Outlander that his son, Asherad, possessed greater Force potential than himself and would undoubtedly surpass him into adulthood meaning that any feats attributed to a peak Darth Krayt cannot be used to power scale his father. Which, again, makes sense, considering that Krayt would grow to become one of the strongest characters in the entire Star Wars franchise. Moving into his actual abilities, 
Sherad Het has sadly demonstrated very little in the way of variety. However, I attribute this issue to his sparse appearances rather than any seeming lack of ability. As it would make little sense for a Jedi renowned for his ability to thrive in battle-torn environments not to have some understanding of the Force's more exotic manifestations. During the Battle of the Judland Wastes, Sherad displayed a strong affinity with Force Sense, physical augmentation, and telekinesis, three of the most basic and common powers associated with the Jedi Order. Though never shown in the series, it's reasonable to assume that the Tamer of Tyrants also possessed skills with Force Telepathy and Force Healing, as they too were amongst the most ubiquitous of light side abilities. Last but not least, Sherad Het is confirmed by Eeth Koth's official encyclopedia entries to have mastered his teacher's signature Force technique, Crucitorn. Also referred to by the fan coin term Pain Transcendence, Crucitorn was a neutral aligned power that enabled practitioners to reduce and absorb the effects of physical pain far beyond their natural thresholds. Functionally speaking, Think of Crucitorn almost like the Star Wars equivalent of Vegeta's Ultra Ego technique from the Dragon Ball Super series. Through vigorous mental discipline, users could stabilize their performance levels by cutting themselves off from painful sensations, or, conversely, enhance their capabilities by feeding off them almost like an automatic adrenaline rush. Like Ultra Ego, Crucitorn's level of effectiveness was tied to the skills and physical strength of the practitioner, with Eeth Koth's tough Zabraki hide being noted to have made him an ideal vessel for the ability. Humans like Sherad Het have also proven to be well suited for Crucitorn's properties. While recapping his backstory to Kiadi, Het states that the Tuscans observing him had been impressed by his endurance. He also notes that his Jedi powers proved extremely beneficial when clawing his way up the ladder to Warlord status, suggesting that Crucitorn had been vital to his success. Although this is unstated anywhere in the lore, Sherad's mastery of Crucitorn was likely what had enabled him to engage Aura Singh so effectively with his severely hampered physical condition. Finally, we have the most detailed and important analysis segment of this video, that being Sherad Het's direct combative prowess and showings. Starting with his accolades, Sherad was noted on multiple occasions throughout the Outlander arc as well as its follow-ups and tie-in material to have been one of the most accomplished Jedi of his generation, with Obi-Wan proclaiming him to have reached almost legendary status. Having spent years throwing himself into the service of the Order in an effort to quell his internal conflicts, Het's acts of daring earned him many names, including the Howl Runner, the Champion of Kermar, the Nemesis of Pirates, the Defender of Camparis, the Hound of Worlds, the Tamer of Tyrants, and the Nemesis of the Kim. Het's fame eventually grew to eclipse that of even his own master, with several sources stating that Eeth Koth became more well-known for being the guy who trained Het than anything he had ever accomplished in his Jedi career. While eclipsing someone's reputation does not necessarily mean that you have eclipsed them in strength, Shrad's battle prowess is attributed to council levels in both the first and fourth issues of Outlander. As mentioned previously, the mere possibility of Sherad falling to the dark side was enough for the Council to take direct action, with Koth stating that the Tuscan's power would prove a major asset to anyone rocking a black cloak and a red lightsaber. The Zabrak would go on to say that although he believed that he should have been the one to be chosen to track down Sherad, the Council had forbid it due to the risk of their past roles as master and student staying his hand if combat became unavoidable. 
Though never explicitly stated, the comic heavily implies that Eeth and Sherad's connection had been far deeper than was common for Jedi teachers and their pupils at the time, being more akin to that of a father and a son. When Kiadi Mundi asks why he had not been asked to vote on the matter, Eeth answers by stating that it was because the council had already decided that the Sarian would be the one asked to go citing the fact that Mundi had been the only member of the Jedi Council who had not known Sherad personally or fought by his side, therefore lacking any possible emotional baggage. Yoda follows up Koth's declarations by stating that if Sherad Het had become a follower of the Dark Side, Kiadi was the only living Jedi with the skills to defeat him in battle. Ki says that his teacher is flattering him, but Yoda claps back by stating that he only speaks the truth, to which no objection is ever given. Jumping ahead to Outlander issue 4, when Kiadi finally reveals to Sherad the return of the Sith and the death of Qui-Gon, Sherad remarks that he had been wondering why the Jedi Council had sent Mundi after him instead of the old rascal he had once known. These two sequences go a long way towards narrowing down Sherad Het's scaling. Due to Eeth being denied specifically due to his emotional ties to Sherad possibly staving his hand in battle, it's reasonable to assume that the two Jedi were at least somewhat comparable as fighters, especially considering how closely the situation mirrors that of Darth Vader and Obi-Wan during the final act of Revenge of the Sith. Now, Koth's level of power is notoriously difficult to gauge for a number of reasons, not the least of which being the drastically different ways in which the Legends and Disney continuities credit him. However, since Sherad was written as a classic EU character, I think it's only fair to keep our comparisons to his teacher classic EU-centric. As noted by multiple sources, Eeth Koth was a seasoned member of the Jedi High Council who was considered formidable for both his martial skills and his aforementioned crazy endurance. Being able to fend off General Grievous for a short time with an injured arm before being jumped by Magna Guards. Granted, this is the TCW iteration of Grievous, which is considerably less impressive than his past incarnation. However, like I said, Koth was injured at the time, so the feat is still a good demonstration of his and by proxy Het's tenacity, if nothing else. Moving on, Yoda's reference to Kiadi Mundi's skills being sufficient to defeat Sherad is significant, since it honestly wouldn't make any sense for the Council to send someone who is drastically weaker than the Howl Runner to confront him, regardless of whether or not there was any personal history between them. As noted by his biography in the Clone Wars Adventures video game, Kiadi Mundi was one of the most formidable lightsaber duelists of the prequel era, having held his own against an early Asajj Ventress and was the last Jedi standing against a proper General Grievous during the Battle of Hypori. In regards to more direct scaling, Kiadi's original databank entry states that he was considered to be in the upper tier of the Jedi Council alongside Mace Windu and Yoda during the time of Revenge of the Sith. While upper tier in this context could refer to either wisdom or influence, if the statement is referring to strength, Kiadi might unironically be stronger than Jedi Masters such as Kit Fisto, Saisi Tin, or Egan Kolar, which just saying that makes his death scene all the more perplexing. Although these accolades and feats were made in reference to Kiadi Mundi during the Clone Wars, which takes place over a decade after Outlander, the Sarian is confirmed by his various character sheets to have attained much of his reputation before being named to the Council. Heck, Sherad even says that he had heard of Ki before he'd even gone into exile. The Sarian was also mentioned in the same vein as Qui-Gon Jinn for Council seat consideration by Mace following the death of Master Micah Giat in the comic Jedi Council Acts of War. Speaking of the old rascal, Sherad's reference to Qui-Gon as someone the Jedi Council would send after him suggests that he considered the Maverick to be strong enough to challenge him, since it's made abundantly clear that he considered the possibility of assassination on more than one occasion. 
Qui-Gon is stated in every mainline version of the Phantom Menace story to be a council-level fighter, standing as one of the most able swordmasters of his era. He was able to match a slightly weakened Darth Maul's strength while being caught off guard on Tatooine, and could give a healthy version of the Sith Apprentice a serious fight on feed, even gaining the upper hand at certain points. These feats are made all the more impressive when we consider that Jin was no longer in his fighting prime, something Maul could pick up on from quite literally the first ignition of their sabers. For reference, Sherad Het has been absent from the Jedi Order for roughly 18 years before the events of Phantom Menace, meaning his frame of reference for Qui-Gon was almost certainly one closer to his peak, making the scaling between the two men even more notable. Moving into technique and attributes, Sherad Het's primary martial arts disciplines have not been confirmed in any source. Though based on what he has demonstrated as well as what has been implied, we can make an educated guess. Sherad wielded a single-bladed lightsaber with an average-sized handle, silver, black, and bronze plating, and no special mechanisms. Although the weapon was originally depicted producing a red-hued blade, John Jackson Miller's Kenobi novel would retcon the saber to have always produced the green-hued blade seen in the Republic Clone Wars comics and beyond. As is typical for a Tuscan, Het would also carry a Gadurfi staff during his time as a war leader. In regards to his pure techniques, Sherad has demonstrated a respectable range for such an obscure character. During his two major fights, he frequently called on his telekinetic abilities to control the tide of the battlefield, and has demonstrated an advanced level of skill with Jar Kai dual weapon fighting, suggesting that his primary style might have been Nyman, the sixth form of classical Jedi fighting that hybridized elements from forms 1 through 5, and is the confirmed specialization of his son Asherad. In regards to alternative combat training, Het was highly adept in the art of unarmed fighting, possibly the Tereskaze style his son mastered, is implied to be capable of using a knife for more than just cooking, and although he has never been depicted utilizing the Sand People's signature Slicer rifle in a fight, it's basically guaranteed that he can. Shifting into feats and showcased scaling, Sherad Het was born during an age where large-scale conflicts were still relatively uncommon, and lightsaber duels were regulated mainly to training rather than fights to the death. That being said, while his initial beginnings might have been peaceful, Sherad was still an immensely powerful warrior. His positions as Eeth Koth's apprentice, a Jedi hero, and a Tuscan war leader bringing him to the forefront of many engagements. During his days as the Howl Runner, among other epithets, Sherad would battle some of the most notorious scum and villainy the galaxy had to offer. Despite knowing virtually nothing about the specifics of these countless exploits, we can see by the visuals that accompany the book's flashbacks that Het fought myriads of pirates, beasts, and the like in both large-scale military campaigns and one-on-one -on -one combat, and emerged victorious on every occasion. Although these feats are clearly different from, say, Kyle Katarn mowing down hordes of Reborn during the Jedi Outcast game, since, as mentioned, lightsaber to lightsaber fighting was still a rarity in Sherad's era, strength in numbers is a real thing, regardless of force sensitivity level, and I genuinely have a hard time believing that a man called the Tamer of Tyrants got the title solely from taking down worthless fodder. Jumping back to the non-flashback events of Outlander, we have the fights the Tusken Jedi is shown actually taking part in. During the Battle of the Judland Wastes, Sherad Het would lead his Tusken army against the combined forces of Gardula and Jabba the Hutt in what could be said to be one of the largest scale battles we ever see take place on Tatooine. 
with both Gadurfi staff and lightsaber in hand. Sherad was beset by hordes of soldiers and slew many of them, including Gardula's personal guard, until a surprise sniper shot through the shoulder from the Jedi hunter Aura Singh finally incapacitated him long enough for the Hutt's forces to decimate his Tuscans. Singh proceeded to engage the wounded Sherad in a duel, and through a combination of her martial and force skills, succeeded in killing the venerated Jedi Knight. Asherad and Kiadi tried to intervene, but it was too late. Sherad's last act in this world being to pass on his lightsaber to his son and make him swear to never use his weapon in anger or vengeance. So was this promise kept, and so too was it eventually broken. Although the exact number of enemies Sherad slew in his final battle is not stated, even if we just go by what we see transpire on panel, his kill count would equate to roughly 14 of Gardula's soldiers of various alien species. Now, much like the Tamer of Tyrants stuff, the level of impressiveness you can ascribe to these showings depends on how you contextualize them. Obviously, none of these goons would be able to measure up to someone like Darth Maul or even Boba Fett, but to be fair, they were tough enough to take on Het's Tusken tribesmen, whom he trained, and as I've said, strength in numbers is a very real thing that should never be overlooked. Sherad Het's most notable opponent during his Judlin battle was Aura Singh, a former Jedi apprentice turned bounty hunter who served as the primary antagonist of the Once Bitten, Hunt for Aura Singh, and Jedi Ala Sakura comics, and a secondary antagonist in the Coruscant Knights 2 Street of Shadows and Legacy of the Force Tempest novels. Shortly before their engagement, Singh kills six of Sherad's warriors before shooting the Tuscan war leader through the shoulder, knocking him off of Gardula's speeder onto his head. Singh made her way over to the wounded Jedi Knight, and the two began to fight. Though initially evenly matched, Singh gained the upper hand when she used the force to pelt Sherad with a barrage of stones, allowing her to quickly close the distance and stab him through the chest. This act being arguably the most significant kill we ever see her pull off in the entire franchise. Now, as I think my description of these events make clear, this fight was far from a decisive win-loss scenario. As noted by multiple sources, Aura Singh was one of the most prolific Jedi killers of the pre-Clone Wars timeframe. Having briefly withstood the combined force of Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi before retreating, and later going on to give Ayla Sakura a high-diff fight during the Clone Wars proper. Aura even fought Jason Solo decades later during the early stages of the Second Galactic Civil War while he was purposefully nerfing himself and managed to press him for a brief period. While all of those accolades and showings are highly impressive, I do not view them as any sort of indication that Sherad Het falls short of his legend, because, like with Cole Skywalker vs. Darth Nile, I have very little doubt that Sherad would defeat Aura if the two had went at it in a fair one-on-one -on -one engagement. Remember, Sherad had been fighting a small army for an extended period of time before being shot through the shoulder, and when he and Aura did finally tussle, the two went blow for blow the entire time, Aura only gaining the upper hand when she TK pelted Het with stones. Furthermore, Sherad's guard goes down when, and only when, one of the hurled stones slams directly into the back of his head, the exact same spot he had landed on after Aura had shot him off of Gardula's speeder, which is an insane detail I never noticed until I started working on this video. Sherad fought well, better than most would do in his shoes, but he was clearly at the end of his rope by the time Singh drew her blade against him. Although Aura was shown fighting off a few of Het's sand people before their duel, not only did she dispatch them quickly while only taking a single blow herself, but the skirmish occurred before Gardula's forces had even arrived at the wastes, giving the assassin a longer recovery time for lesser injuries. 
Yes, Aura managed to equal Sherad's attacks and ultimately deliver the finishing blow, but the specific manner in which it is depicted makes it clear that this victory was not achieved by conventional means. If that wasn't enough, there is even evidence that Sherad Het is inherently above Aura Singh via scaling. Excluding Jason Solo, who was purposefully nerfing himself, Aura has never faced and defeated foes on the level that Sherad has been attributed to. As mentioned, Sherad is confirmed to be council level and is implied to be of a similar strength to a prime Qui-Gon, and Aura retreated from a post-prime Qui-Gon and a Padawan Kenobi after a short skirmish, saying straight up that the two were more than she bargained for, which Obi-Wan reinforces when recounting the tale to Han Solo during their journey to Alderaan. All in all, Aura Singh is an incredibly powerful combatant, but given the story context surrounding the Outlander engagement and the various supplemental info, it's clear to me that what occurred on Tatooine was not a definitive victory, and had Sherad got into that duel fresh, the outcome would have been substantially different than the one we got. Alright, so at the end of the day, how powerful is Sherad Het? While his obscurity does make power scaling him a bit difficult, given everything we have seen, everything that has been stated, and everything that can be logically inferred, there is no question that Sherad is a formidable Jedi by the standards of the Star Wars prequel era, and is decently high tier when compared to the franchise as a whole. Due to the nature of his accolades and feats, I believe it is fair to conclude that the Jedi Knight Sherad Het was in the same tier as Eeth Koth and Qui-Gon Jinn, but was also marginally weaker than Kiadi Mundi. If I were to get real specific and rank the four characters in sequential order, I would have Eeth at the bottom, followed by Episode 1 Qui-Gon, then Sherad, the same spot I would put Prime Qui-Gon, and then finally I would have Kiadi at the top. Sherad's legends and lore prove that he is far above the basic members of his era's Jedi Order, and due to Eeth and Yoda's statements about him requiring direct council intervention to be defeated if necessary, it stands to reason that his strength is comparable to that specific caliber of Jedi. Aura Singh may have been the one to slay him, but as I've said repeatedly, this was a victory laden with circumstances that the comic makes rather clear. Had both combatants been at the peak of their health and there had been no outside interference at play, there is little doubt in my mind that the Howl Runner would have defeated the Jedi Hunter with mid-difficulty. As for Sherad's scaling compared to the Sith of his era, Darth Maul, Darth Sidious, and Darth Plagueis, that's a relatively easy line to follow. While I do think that an argument could be made for Sherad possibly surviving the Duel of Fates due to his superior stamina compared to Qui-Gon, and the fact that it has been implied in certain sources that Maul would have been defeated had he not separated Qui-Gon from Obi-Wan, if we are talking about a straight 1v1, then I believe that the Howl Runner would lose to the Sith Apprentice after an intense fight. Maul, of course, being weaker than Episode 1 Darth Sidious, who is confirmed to be on the same overall level as Darth Plagueis. Comparing Sherad's power in relation to his son, Asherad, comes down to a matter of time frames. Peak Darth Crate would obviously obliterate Sherad since he scales to and above characters far stronger than Kiadi Mundi, while Padawan Sherad Het would almost certainly lose to Sherad, since he did worse against Aura Singh while healthy than his dad had done while injured. This makes sense considering that Sherad stated that his son would grow to surpass him into adulthood. I would even go as far as to claim that Asherad Het during the early dark times was marginally stronger than his father, due to his ability to give early dark times Obi-Wan Kenobi a good fight before being defeated. 
While Asherad Het did possess a number of environmental advantages in that confrontation, something I think a lot of people overlook, Obi-Wan still considered the younger Jedi's capabilities to be formidable, with the Tusken tanking many of his physical attacks and responding in kind. Remember, this is an Obi-Wan who is, at the very least, equal to himself at the end of Revenge of the Sith, which is relative to that of a Mustafar Darth Vader. If Asherad Het can give someone of that caliber a hard time, then I think it's reasonable to assume that the once and future Dragon of the Sith had finally eclipsed the feats of Sherad Het, much like he had done with his own father in the days of the legendary Howl Runner. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this installment of Star Wars How Powerful Is. Now it's time to dive headfirst into my collaboration with Jen Sarai, and then the finale to my Versus series Season 7. It's gonna be a little while, but trust me, it's gonna be memorable. As always, I'll be dropping a preview followed by the matchup itself, so stay tuned. May the Force be with you, stay safe, and I'll see you guys later. <laughs>